Welcome back to the La Cancha podcast. And it seems like we went back in time in La Liga. Barcelona scoring for freely. Real Madrid struggling to score. And Atletico Madrid beating Atleti. Uh, but the biggest game of this week was the Seville Derby. And for me, Oscar, this is the biggest game in Spain outside of El Clasico. And it's it certainly lived up to Bill and Yeah, I agree with you in terms of it being the biggest game apart from El Clasico. And... My, the atmosphere was very great for Sevilla fans. Sevilla were very intense, started pressing right from the get-go. Betis, not as much, not so intense today. But mm-hmm. overall, it was a very feisty derby. And yeah, very yeah. good. Like you could tell right from the get-go that Sevilla were like really intense. And like the, like, you know, when a game starts and you can mm-hmm. tell that like this team is going to win. And I got that feeling right from like after the fifth minute because like Sevier were just like super intense they were super dominant it's like I felt this was the best Sevier performance since last year since May of last year when they were so close to the title yeah this is up there it's one of their best performances this season this and the one against Atleti uh, yeah I noticed what Sevier did was that they would press for 10 minutes for 10 minutes they like drop off allow things to down and they'll press again like that change in rhythm just confused Betis like every Betis player that wasn't in the back four was a passenger for the first half that's just how it was and obviously Bravo in goal for real Betis didn't really help their case to win this game no and it feels like in the first in that first half I don't remember Betis having a shot on target and I believe Sevilla had like eight shots so it just felt like in that game like um Pellegrini's tactics just didn't work for Betis yeah Betis had one shot off target at the end of the half that was it you know you know this game reminded me the first half at least it reminded me of PSG versus Real Madrid like that level of domination where the opposition is carrying players as passengers that's just how it is I also want to like mention one severe player for his performance today, Jesus Corona. He was so good. Yeah, he, he was very good. And he combined very well with Jesus Navas because they both they're both like wingers who can play as a wing back and they combined very well together in this game, didn't they? Yeah. And Tecatito is not Tecatito is like he can play right back, right wing back, right wing striker left wing, and I heard that he used to play as an attack midfielder in his early days, so he's a real Swiss army knife, as they say. Yeah, and with with that attack, like, the, the chances came through that right side. It seemed like when the game started, the chances were through that right side, and the first goal came from penalty, and do you think that was a penalty? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and from there, like, Sevilla converted, it was 1-0, and then you saw, like, in after that moment of, like, the goal, like, you felt that Sevilla were going to make it the second, and there were a few injuries, like, one to Papu Gomez, and I feel sorry for him, because, like, he was having his best moment in Sevilla. Munir had that goal, and then in the second half, it felt like Sevilla sort of took stock of, like, being 2-0 up, and they defended throughout that second half. Like, it was... They had, without having the ball, they had control of the game. Yeah. I also feel personally part of the reason they dropped that back a bit was because Diego Carlos came off. I don't know if it's an injury or anything, but he came off. Goodell came on. They were effectively playing with two midfielders as center back. So I felt yeah. that played in decision, a part in their decision to kind of take it easy in the second half. Yeah. And it feels that that. That's the problem for Sevilla because, like, the injuries are beginning to rack up because, like, Papu got injured. Kunde wasn't available for this, but it feels like Diego Carlos is going through something because in a couple in none, in the Europa League, he was substituted after forty five minutes, and it was a doubt for this game, and that's something that might hamper them if they are to challenge for the title because they need without their full centre back pairing, they're much weaker side and they play much more conservative game because they don't have that trust in the back. Yeah. The absence of Kundel or Carlos could be very detrimental to them. The absence of Fernando in midfield is also very important because he's not the same player playing at the back, obviously. 
Yeah, I feel Fernando had played in the neutral. He might have been they might have won by a bigger scoreline. But yeah. I'm sure Betis they wouldn't have too much time to lick their wounds. They have the Cup of the Race semifinals against Ryu this week. How do you see that going? I still I say Betis as favorite to get to the final. Unless Ryu like really step big give a big performance. Yeah. Which I think is unlikely at this moment. So I'll go with Betis making the final. Yeah. But let's talk about Ryu for a bit. They played against Real Madrid in the Madrid Derby and I felt they were back to the Ryu that started the season and that the pressing was intense. They were able to recover the ball a lot of times from Real Madrid. Real Madrid didn't have a great day in midfield. And, but the problem was once they recovered the ball, they lacked that finishing touch in the final third. And they really made Real Madrid struggle in a game that you felt maybe Real Madrid would have passed over Rayo because Rayo, they were in bad form. They obviously have the Copa de Rey semifinals to think of, but they showed possibly their best version. Yeah, Rayo, this was an improvement on what they showed in the last few games, like against Osasuna and Elche. It was unfortunate, however, that they were facing Thibaut Courtois, arguably the best goalkeeper in the world now. Yeah. And it was also unfortunate that Casemiro wasn't sent off because I'm not sure about you, but for me, that tackle was criminal and he should have gone off. The ref should have given the red card there. Do you, and the ref didn't consult VAR, and that was something that confused me. What do you think about it? If they gave him a red, I won't have been shocked. I mean, we, I, we talked about this last week. I'm not surprised by the refereeing decisions anymore. It's just so bad. Also, the fact that Casemiro escapes with, more than, like, with less than the punishment he usually deserves is not a surprise anymore. Yeah. But, and I feel in some ways, like he gets away with it throughout his career, like just getting away with like those fouls, those like, mm-hmm. it's surprising that he doesn't have as much red cards to his name, given how aggressive he is in tackling, given how much fouls he commits. But he's a player that seems to be like a pantomime villain of La Liga and just gets away with like just rock mm-hmm. tackles. Yeah, I, I like, I kind of like love him because <laughs> I, I think it's his smile because. He's, he never argues with the ref when it like comes to these things. Like he just like owns up. He's like, "Oh, I made this foul. I'm so sorry." And then I feel that like plays a decision. It, it plays a part in the ref's decision making when they want to book him. Because if you're like arguing and throwing your hands up, I noticed that Spanish referees hate dissent in any shape or form. So yeah. I feel it's just his crafty way of avoiding bookings. Sure. But what's going on with Real Madrid? Like, it seems like they're struggling again in midfield. Again, like, looking forward, they have a comfortable lead in the league. So, but looking forward to that PSG game, they don't breed that much confidence. Like, in the midfield, they really struggle against Rayo, a team that they should have enough quality to beat by a comfortable scoreline, especially given the form that they were in. Yeah. And Real Madrid... I, I, I still feel like that fatigue team we've always talked about is a factor. The fact that teams are like obviously stepping up their game against Ancelotti's Real Madrid, they're figuring out the patterns of play that they have and trying to nullify them. But for me, the biggest like blow to Real Madrid for a second leg is the fact that Casemiro and Mendy won't be there. I still feel that Real Madrid, if they decide to take on PSG, they'll beat them. And it seems like right now, in terms of goals, they're like just struggling to find that killer instinct. But it's, and there's this Benzema, Vinicius, Dependencia mm-hmm. at the moment. Like if they don't show up, it doesn't seem like Real Madrid will score goals. Or if Asensio doesn't score a world, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like anything's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it feels that way. But what I've noticed with Real Madrid is that they always find a way. Yeah. It doesn't matter how bad they play. If you don't finish them off, they will hurt you. And that's the sign of a good team, I guess, when you get wins in difficult situations. Yeah, and that was summed up when Alvaro had the chance. It was one on one with Couture. And moments later, Benzema and Vinicius combined beautifully to score the goal. But the same that's thing not, every week. 
yeah, a team that's not going through goal scoring problems just at this moment is Barcelona. And again, they it seems like four is the lucky number because they stopped Athletic for four after sticking Napoli for four in midweek. And it seems like all is going well in Barcelona. Like Aubameyang scoring, Dembele scoring a goal. Like the future looks bright for them. And what's changed, like apart from the signings, what has changed in the way Barcelona is playing? And how come all of a sudden, like the goals are coming? I feel the first thing that has changed is the work ethic. Like the pressing is much better. Like you can see it's organized as before. As against before, when we used to press, it was headless tricky. We are just running around aimlessly. So that has improved. Obviously, the signings have helped because you have more quality on the pitch and on the bench. Yeah. And yeah, Javi's ideas seem to be getting across well. It's not perfect yet, so by no means. And it was Athletic who played their second best exercise. But still, it was a very encouraging performance. Yeah, and let's talk about Dembele for a moment because like he got booed by the fans. He scored a wonder goal. And do you think there's a chance he stays at Barcelona beyond the season? I want him to stay. Like, really, I, I've, I've talked about this with some people and they're like, Xavi believes in Dembele. Like, if you have a manager who believes in you, I believe you should stay and let that manager, both of you, take each other to the next level. Because this could be his team, like Dembele is in charge of this team for a few years, if he decides to stay. Because he looked like Cristiano Ronaldo for Manchester United in this game, like with the skills, with the way he scored. <laughs> he, looked, he looked very lively, he looked very up for it. And yeah, so like maybe, maybe like he has this good second half of the season and he's convinced to stay, but it doesn't look like it so far. And it seems like the young also got on the goals. Memphis Depay got, got on goals as well. So, like, Barcelona are scoring for fun. And you see what they did in Napoli. So it's not just, like, in the league that they're doing well. They're also showing strength in Europe. The question is whether this Barcelona team, are they favorites to win the Europa League? I'll say second favorites is the answer. But it depends on what Sevilla has been. If Sevilla decide to focus on the league and they get knocked out early, then we're favorites. If not, it's their cup. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk about Athletic for a moment. It's like they did rest players for this game. And um, obviously the eyes are on Valencia, who they played not too well against Mallorca. Gabriel got a wonder goal, but... It seems like Mallorca, they were the better, they were the better team and they possibly should have won. But like the minds of both teams that were set on Thursday, how do you see this going? Where do you think this game will be won or lost? It will be won depending on what Valencia, how Valencia approached the game. Valencia have more talent than Bordelas gives them credit for. Like, I feel if he lets them play, they could do some. Damage to more damage to Athletic Club than they've done in the other two games. Yeah. For Athletic, they just have to be solid. Like they'll create some chances, but then it's a matter, it's always been a question of can Athletic Club take their chances. Yeah. So I feel it's a very both teams have areas they can hurt each other. But I kind of fancy Athletic Club to finish the job because I'm sure Marcelino. Marcelino knows his best like system and everything. Borderless kind of tinkers. You, you get me? So I feel the certainty that Marcelino and his players have amongst each other is what's going to carry them over the line. And also, I feel like for Valencia, one of the things that will go for them is the fact that it is a Mestalla. And the yeah, crowd that, that's will be able a to like, team for them. Yeah, the crowd will be able to like pick them up, but like their problem with Valencia this season is that defensively they let a lot of chances come and, come and go. It seems like it's easy to create chances against Valencia. And but I guess at the same time, one of Athletic's weakness, as you mentioned, is that they can't finish they up can. the chances. They have no real center forward. Yeah. But they would have Sunset, they would have Berenguer. It seems like Nico Williams is back as well. Mm -hmm. So it will be a very interesting affair. So at the moment, you're leaning towards a Betis Athletic final? Yes. 
I was actually hoping for an athletic Rayo final, but Rayo yeah. has been. Yeah, yeah. And it seems. Uh, have you heard of the prophecy of Betis? What's the prophecy? So the prophecy of Betis is that Betis are going to win the Copa del Rey, and a lot of these things are happening when they won the Copa del Rey in 1977. And guess who they played in the final in 77? Athletic Club. Yes, so <laughs> because it's like they played Sevilla, the game got suspended. The same thing happened. Like they played like um, similar opponents all up to the way to the final. Yeah. So it seems like Betis fans are getting really excited about that. But let's move back to La Liga and let's talk about Atletico Madrid. And it's, it's things have changed for them. Like they're keeping clean sheets. It's like back to the old routine for those men. Yeah, it's been. Three of it's been three very solid performances in a row from Athletic. The only goal they've considered is like basically the only chance, big chance they gave up. That was to Man United. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, they've gone back to the three at the back formation. That's looking more solid now, especially with Lodi playing so well. Joe yeah, Felix is getting week, consistency. Though. Yeah, yeah. what you were saying. Lodi's had a great week. He gave an assist in the Champions League. He scored a brace, which is which, which is something surprising. And it feels like he's been liberated in a way, having Ronaldo, like having Lodi and Ronaldo. It's similar to when Sevilla, or with Sevilla, when they had like Jesus Navas and Tecatito. Yeah. Yeah. Lodi is a very good attacking player. Just don't make him defend that. You'll get a lot of um, quality <laughs> from him. But I feel like this Lodi team creates an interesting problem for Simeone because how is he going to fit Carrasco back into the team? Yeah, yeah, that, that'll be interesting. But I feel in some ways maybe Llorente's position might be questioned because I don't think he's having a great season so far. Like in the game against United and in this in the game against Salta, he wasn't at his best. Like he wasn't able to get the runs and do what he did so well last season. Possibly that's because Strippier is not there, but yeah. I feel struggling a bit, Llorente. Yeah, Llorente, Llorente's productivity was a big factor in Atleti winning the league last season, and his productivity has been there this season. Because, like I said, like you said, Trippier is gone. But even when Trippier was there, Trippier wasn't really playing that well either. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like his position could be under threat. Because Carrasco is good, probably going to go to that side if Lodi keeps this up. Yeah. And let's talk a bit about Koke, because this position too might be under threat because of the way Herrera and Condobia have been playing. In Condobia, I felt he was so brilliant against Manchester United. He had Pogba, Bruno, and um, and, and I forget the third right. person, but he had Manchester United midfield in, in his pocket, as well as Herrera. Herrera was incredible. Yeah. Remember the other time we were talking about the players that Cholo should be starting more? Yeah, he's, they're playing now, and it's kind of no surprise that Atleti are playing better. Koke, yeah, this has, compared to last season, he's had a drop off, and it's unfortunate the timing because he's out of the team through an injury, I believe, and then someone has come in and he's playing really well. So he might find it hard to get back into the team. Yeah, and it's it's just like with that level, I feel with what Herrera and Condobia bring, they're good tacklers. Mm-hmm. Condobia can win balls in the air, and that's something Atleti has struggled throughout the season. The ability to be dominant in aerial duels, the ability to be dominant in tackling in the midfield, and you bring Condobia in and he retrieves the ball while he's able to distribute well. Like his pass for Lodi for the second goal was incredible, and he's playing at a level that I would say is like similar to the best defensive midfielders in La Liga, when you talk about Fernando, Sergio Busquets, or Casimiro, in recent weeks, he's been up there with them. Yeah, he's been more than up there with them. The issue with Condogbia has been fitness and just general consistency and the fact that Simeone has played him at centre-back sometimes. But if fully fits Condogbia, I said this even last season, adds so much to his athletic team. Sure. And let's talk about Ronaldo for a moment. Like, what do you, how do you rate his signing so far for Atleti? Because he's been solid defensively. Yeah, he's been so far, it's so far so good for Ronaldo, except for the goal that um, Elanga scored. But he's, he's really solid. 
and he contributes a bit to the attack. He's uh, him and Lodi's chemistry is quite good as well. Yeah, and moving on from Atleti, we we're going to Villarreal Espanol, and this was the game of Jeremy Pino. Did you see this coming? Him scoring four goals, the youngest player ever in La Liga to score a first half hat trick, and I think he's the youngest player ever to score four goals. <laughs> No, he's, he's the fourth youngest. Yeah. Let me see. I, I have this here somewhere. Santimina was younger than him when he scored four goals. Four, yeah. Yeah, one against Rayo, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, um, the youngest was Iragori. He was 17. Wow. And someone else was, and Lazan, Lascano was 19. But those were like in the 1930s. Santimina's hat trick. Sorry, poker was in 2015 against Rayo. And then you have Paco Jeremy Rayo. Pino today. Huh? I said that was Paco Hermes' Rayo back in the day where playing yeah. Rayo was an easy, easy game. Yeah, it was, it was, it was Paco Hermes' Rayo. Yeah, but, but with Pino, like, it, it, it's amazing because he has been out of the team for a while, giving out while Sam Chikweze has been playing. He comes into the team and he scores four goals. Like, it's, it's incredible, like, the options that Villarreal have, especially when you consider the fact that Gerard Moreno has been out. Like, and what, what do you see is Pino's ceiling with his team? Do you think he deserves to play at a bigger team than Villarreal? Do you think he's someone who can lead Villarreal to, like, something big, maybe another title? Mm. He's going to... If his ceiling is a very, like, he can... I feel the ceiling is that he can take Villarreal to another level. Yeah. That's providing they obviously other players do their bits, but Pino is a very, very fantastic talent. Yeah. These Canary Island boys, they're made of different stuff, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's like Pino and Pedri and stuff. It's like Grand yeah. Canary can have their own, their own little national team, and maybe they'll be Spain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and- and with Pino, like, where does he fit in with Samuel Chukwese, with Dan Juma? Is it possible to play Dan Juma, Pino, Chukwese, and Moreno at the same time? Uh, it's, it's possible, actually. Chukwese could play on the right, Dan, sorry, Dan Juma on the left, Pino and Jared, like, in the middle together, but um, Emery is never going to do that. <laughs> No, Emery prefers one of his wingers to occasionally talk into midfield. That's why he starts Trigueros there on the So yeah. Emery won't do it, but I can say it's been possible on FIFA or something. Yeah. But Villarreal, they've been scoring lots of goals recently. They're like the third highest goal scorers in La Liga at the moment. And what's changed for them? Because initially they struggled to get goals, but now it's, it feels like they're winning consistently they're winning by big margins from time to time and they look really like a solid team yeah what was wrong with them before was mainly the stupid mistakes and not converting some of the chances they were getting yeah. i think since late november all that has like stopped being an issue like they don't make as much mistakes in attack they've built a lot of chemistry like dia obviously started scoring Moreno came back, started scoring, and I feel like this mood there in is like it started from one player and it became an infectious team, and they're just having the best time. They've only lost one in 12, and they're looking really solid, as you say. Yeah, and it feels like at the moment, like um, initially by December, it felt Madrid and Sevilla were much better than the rest of teams in the league, but it feels like right now, Barcelona with the recent improvements are a lot closer, very close to them. Atletico in the last two weeks, they've seen like to improve Villarreal. They've improved since, since Christmas, as you said, Betis as well. So it feels like that top six or so is a lot tighter than like, maybe not in terms of points, but in terms of quality, it's a lot tighter than it was Mm -hmm. in December. Yeah. December. And let's talk about, Espanol for a moment because they haven't won in, in 2022 and results like this isn't doing Victor Moreno any favors. Yeah, I feel the most damning team for them was that they just didn't try. Like normally the team who has less of the ball runs more, right? Yeah. 
Villarreal had way more of the ball and ran more than Espanyol. Like that's pretty damn. If and for distance covered, the Espanyol are one of the lowest teams in the league. So they they really need to. I think Diego Lopez was saying the club needs to get their act together because that relegation battle is starting to look interesting and they might just get sucked into it. Yeah, yeah. And let, let's talk a bit uh, about Real Sociedad then we get to the big clash at the bottom. They got the job done. Um, also, sooner it seems like they've lost momentum. But with Real Sociedad, they, again, they disappointed in Europe, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing that they're going out to Leipzig because they look tired. Yeah. They look tired, but like today it feels like they were somewhat liberated. Yeah. I, I, going out to Europa League at this stage is pretty good. It's a good thing, in my opinion, because as a squad, they're not ready to go far in that competition while competing in the league. So the important thing for Real Sociedad is, as a club at this point is just to consistently be a European team and then from there build build on that eventually, whether it's signing new players or whatever. And yeah, they seemed more free today, more energetic. And their bad week is essentially over. And like, let's move back to the relegation zone that you were so excited to talk about. <laughs> Start with Levante. They, they've, been, they've been incredible recently. They've changed. It's a new Levante right now and Jorge de Frutas, my God. He had a nice brace. They've had seven points in their last nine games. They're, they're not conceding as many goals. Like, what have you noticed tactically that before they were a team that conceded four or three goals per game, but now they've kept two clean sheets in the past two weeks? What's changed? I don't think too much has changed, to be honest. They're playing busy. They play basically the same way every week. It's just that the chances are starting to be converted. I feel, I think it's that win against Atleti that gave them confidence because from there, they played well against Celta. They destroyed Elche. I, 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 I just think it's that like one unexpected win that just gave them this boost of confidence and confidence and your mental state really makes a difference. Like look at Morales. He's playing very well. De Frutus is playing well as well. Danny Gomez too. Yeah, and there's six points behind Granada at the moment, which is, I believe, the 17th. Do you see yeah. there's a chance of them making that difference in gap, especially if Granada loses tomorrow against Cadet? If Granada loses tomorrow, then they have a chance. Because they, let me see, Levante still have to play Granada as well, so that's something they have control of. Um. It, it, it just depends. I, I feel like we'll know more about Levante's chances in two weeks, whether they can actually survive or not, because the gap is still pretty big. I have to consider Cadiz and Alaves might improve too. Sure, sure. But speaking of Alaves, it's, they didn't do so well against 10 man Hatafe. Uh, the, let's talk about Cuenca's red card first. Like, was that a red in your opinion? Absolutely not. You think so? I, I didn't feel it was because, like, I felt like they were just both going for the ball, right? That's what? you see, you see that challenge every game. Like, I don't get how how he's endangering um, Edgar Mendes there. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But after that, right, it feels like from there, Alaves went from strength to strength. They scored a goal, but and as you now, man, he's he's on something. I love that guy. And, <laughs> and the president of the end is not fun club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy is. So, so speak about him like for two minutes. Like tell, tell tell us why he's so good. Like he's he's a lot more confident now. He's always had that talent, but now his confidence is making him apply it like he's. He's scoring bicycle kicks this season, goals from the wing, he amazing headers. He's getting to good positions. His link up play with his teammates is also really good. And since Quique Sanchez Flores came in, this guy has been low on the skill levels of good. I, I know that's an exaggeration, but <laughs> that's just how I feel about the guy. He's, he, he, he's just like, 
he has only had a goal drought of two games since November. He scores every other game. Some games, like he scored a brace in three different games recently. Wow. Yeah. If you're his agent or if you're, his, let's say you were Simeone or you were Lopetegui and you're looking for a new nine, would you want to go for a player like him? Do you think he can play at a Villarreal level, Sevilla level, or can he play at an Atleti level? Like, where do you um, see him in the future? Because with this performance, he's not going to see that it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, Villarreal, like a Europa League level team could be what he's good at, but we'll see if he keeps this up to the end of the season, obviously, because it's a long way to go. But so far, I mean, clubs are definitely going to be asking for him no matter what at the end of the season. Yeah. And a word on a word or two on Alaves, because like this must be a sh- shock blow for them because you can't do it against a 10 minutes half a team. It doesn't look good going forward. Yeah. It was a massive disappointment to not to leave the Colosseum with just one point, considering the context of the relegation battle. So, I don't know. And then their next, in their next four games, they're playing against Sevilla, Real Sociedad, and Atleti. So, they really need the points today. Or yesterday, I mean. And it's a run like that can like destroy a club's chances. I guess they'll be hoping tomorrow that Cadet and Granada finishes in a tie, which still keeps their hopes alive somehow. Yeah. They also the other that game in the four is against Granada too, so they definitely have to win that one, no matter what happens. Yeah, and yeah, speaking about teams that are struggling at the moment, uh, one of the big news of this week outside of Spain was the second of. Marcelo Bielsa and his Leeds team were, they were terrible at the moment. They were conceding sixes, fours, fives. Like, was it justified? Do you think they sacked him too early? Or do you think they should have stuck with him? I think they could, I think they could have stuck with him, to be honest, because it's my own thing with sacking a coach is that if the person who is replacing him isn't better than him, what's the point of doing it in this case? Because I don't know how Jesse Marsh is going to get more out of the lead squad than he also did. Because the problem was Jesse Marsh when he was at Salzburg, his team had similar problems to uh, Le- Bielsa's Leeds. Leeds in that they were conceding like sixes, fours, like they conceded lots of goals in the Champions League when they were with Bayern Munich or with Liverpool in the same group. Maybe it was because of the quality of the opponents, but like they also were very open and he got sacked from Leipzig for a reason. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm not I'm, I'm not convinced by there's also the loyalty aspects people have obviously talked about. Like he brought Leeds into the Premier League when they were gone since 2004. So you know people have their own thoughts on that. Yeah. My own thought is like I don't believe the replacement is going to do any better than him. And their opponents were Spurs, uh, Antonio Conte. Did you, did you hear about his pressure during mid Yeah. He seemed, he seemed like he was <laughs> totally convinced with his team. He's basically begging, please, can you suck me up? <laughs> I, no, but here's the thing. Here's what I was joking about. Antonio Conte has the second or third best win ratio of most of the managers in Europe right now. He wants that win ratio to be maintained. And he can't help that Spurs are that the squad is not as good as it used to be. So I feel he's basically trying to leave because of that. Yeah. yeah but, but, on a serious, but on a serious note, uh, there's no idea there. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically how Conte is sometimes. He just is happy at the place for a while and then things just go bad. And the thing is, in context history, he's always had this um, thing in him where he would complain about a squad or like a squad's not good enough, so that's why I can't win. And that's why he did that a lot at Inter. So maybe yeah. he might not be angry for a move away, but the same reason why I left Inter was he didn't have Lukaku. He wasn't going to have Akimi. He wasn't going to have players that he had faith in to continue that project, to continue a winning project. And it feels right now, this team it's not really a winning project for him. They might not be in the Champions League, which means they might not get that much money. So, yeah, we'll we'll have to keep our eye out on that. 
And did you see Kepa's penalty miss? Yeah, I saw it. I feel sorry. I feel sorry for him. <laughs> Poor guy. Like you're, you, you were brought on to save penalties. You didn't save anyone. And then you go and do that. Yeah. It's the sad reality of football. But if hey, it's, it's what makes football football, isn't it? Yeah. If we were to return to Spain, like where would you place him? Kepa. Um, I'm going to look at the table to figure this out. Give me one moment. Uh, I think Kep. I, th- I I I was always in the on the school of thought that Kepa was treated too harshly by the English media, like he was bl- getting blamed for some things that I didn't necessarily think were his fault. But I don't know. I feel if he he could go back to Valencia, for instance, and be good. Yeah. Valencia's goalkeepers don't always come good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from experience like when whenever you see yeah. how many dominic like in goal you're just like oh my god it's just gonna be a hard day yeah yeah but there's some valencia fans that treat dominic like a god compared to the other two <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah like uh congrats to liverpool and winning that uh yeah. the carabao cup moving on to italy it seems like the title race is getting like very very hot it's muy caliente in italy Juventus are seven points away from the top. Imagine that. No way. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah, they're, they're so close. They're so close. Because all the other teams, Milan and Inter, they keep dropping points. Yeah, they do. Left, right, center. <laughs> they, they might have a yeah. chance at this. Yeah, I, I think you will have a chance if this keeps going on. Like, it's going to be mad if you win this thing again <laughs> at this moment. But I definitely think it's out of 10, I'm going to give it a six because the three above them have a history of bottling things. Yeah. Especially I, Napoli. Yeah, Napoli, they, they got destroyed by Barcelona midweek. And, but it seemed like it didn't affect their confidence because they bit. Natio, I'm sorry, Lazio. Yeah. Uh, to, so, like, they're back to the basics. They're top, joined up in Serie A. But if Juve are to win this, is it more of the fact that Juve have the quality and they have their resilience to get back? Or will it be on the teams above them that they seriously messed up in this race? It's more on the teams above them. And you have to still credit Juve if this does happen because. All you have to do at this point is to just focus on what they can control. Whatever else happens, happens. I'm sure if they win the league, like if you offered them top four three months ago, they'd have snapped, they'd have broken your hand off. So I don't know. I feel you should just keep doing what they're doing. If it leads to a title, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's okay as long as they get top four. Yeah. And thing is, Juve, they didn't really impress me when I saw them against Villarreal. I felt they were, I felt tactically they had a solid game plan, especially in the first half. But they were super cantonature against Villarreal. I'm like, you can't, you shouldn't play like that. <laughs> like, it was like watching an Italian team from back in the 2000s where they just like sit back. And- I haven't seen that many long balls played in a game in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Allegri, I knew you were. Like this, but not this bad, man. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just so funny to watch because, like, they would have, like, eight people behind the ball and they're defending for their lives. And I'm like, this isn't... You're not playing against Barcelona, Madrid, or even Atleti. You're playing against Villarreal, who are stuck in six. But I guess that's that's what Allegri is all about. And it seems like it's working for him, like, domestically and in Europe because they did get a good results. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll see how well this run keeps on going for Juve, whether they can go all the way. A team that doesn't look like they might go all the way is Dortmund. They drop points yet okay. again. And Bayern Munich, they won by the minimum amounts at Frankfurt. And the gap is not eight points. Can we call yeah. this league over? It's, it's, it was over before. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good win for Bayern at Frankfurt because they haven't won at Frankfurt for the last three seasons. So this was wow. good. It, it was good to overcome that demon, I guess. 
Yeah, if you can call it a demon. <laughs> in, <laughs> here are the news about Bayern about them going more for youth players, and because of the wages and salaries are too expensive for them to compete. No, I, I didn't. I, I heard something like that, but I didn't hear the full detail. Yeah. Oh, Bayern are broke too. No, no, it's it's, it's just. I know, like, I, I was just joking. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. kind of saying, no, oh, why not alone? Yeah. <laughs> and and that'll be something to be interesting to that we can talk about maybe even next week because of the news of the Super League and they're gonna have this big announcement on Thursday of how everything has changed. Then it feels like they're going for a full PR drive and it's gonna start right from this Thursday. So it'll be interesting to talk about because things like this, maybe we might see Bayern or Dortmund support the new version of the Super League without promotional relegation, but we don't know what that's going to be like, but we're going to see next week. But this is, it was just something interesting that came out that Bayern, they want, they want to change the strategy, essentially. That'll be interesting. The Super League team, yeah, it feels like full PR at this point. You've like gotten all the massive refusal to it and they're trying to appease as many people as possible yeah yeah but at the same time they might go to court and they might be successful in court but that's that's for the future that'll be may but for next week we should definitely talk about whatever i nearly say is on thursday and the new format and what we think about it and we can have a debate about whether it's a good thing whether it's a bad thing i am for full disclosure, I'm like fully against it. I'm not sure about what, you think about what you think about it. Why, why change things? Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. Uh, interesting week of European football. The European League, thoughts about the draws? Do you think it's good for Spanish clubs or not? Yeah, the, the three draws are pretty good for the teams. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel the same way too. And I guess that's like, the end of this podcast thank you so much again for coming oscar we had a brilliant time speaking and thanks for having me next week yeah. Yeah. see you next week yeah adios guys <laughs>